Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for attending. I mean, <laughs> at about quarter after six, I got a call from Heidi, our uh, interim director, and should we cancel? We've <laughs> never had to do that before. We didn't know what to do or think. And finally, I said, if our presenter arrives, we're on. So, and then you all <laughs> attended. So, thank you very much. <clears throat> okay. Uh, tonight's program, Exploring Ohio Canals. Uh, as all of our programs are, they're supported with a generous donation from former Denison University president, Dale T. Noble, and his wife, Tina. Our presenter, Sarah Harper, is an educator and author who has taught children from preschool through high school and now teaches her three boys on their family farm here in the Granville area. In 2023, Sarah published her first book, Exploring Ohio Canals, and there are copies here if you'd like to get one afterward. Uh, the first in her series, Have Books, Will Travel. Sarah has created this series to inspire readers to travel and connect with heroes of the past from around the United States. She has also been a speaker at schools and libraries in Central Ohio <clears throat> and is passionate about sharing her love of canals with learners of all ages. So, over to you, Sarah. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for having me. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> thank you for braving the weather and coming out and spending the next hour or so with me. I'm really excited and honored to be here with all of you. And I think it's kind of funny, ironic, that I am talking to you about canals tonight uh, because as a child growing up in Licking County, canals was not my thing. Um, I have two wonderful parents that are good educators. I know they tried, but um, I just could not picture how a lock worked. I could not uh, see an aqueduct, how it was formed. I did not understand the structure of the canal system. The whole world made no sense to me uh, as a 10 year old. And so uh, despite the trip on the canal boat and uh, a museum or two, I just I didn't care because I couldn't see it. So through my teens and twenties, it was just a topic I wasn't that interested in. But then as a mother, uh, I decided I wanted to learn something about Cuyahoga Valley National Park, and they have canal history there. So I thought, well, I guess we could give it a try. And I loved it. So about five years, we're into this now, and I've done more and more research, and it's just a fascinating part of Ohio history. So I'm really excited to share um, many of my findings with you tonight and just spend the next hour together. So let's go over uh, what tonight's going to look like. So I'll talk a little bit more about how I got started in all of this uh, intro to me. And then we will talk about Ohio canals and canal history, who built the canals, uh, what it was like to live on the canals, and then why are they gone? What happened to them? Uh, we'll narrow it down and focus on some Licking County lock locations. Um, I know we ran out of papers, but uh, there are some Licking County uh, lock papers. If you did not get one, maybe we can snap a picture. But there are three locations throughout Licking County that you can visit, and I want to give you some history um, for each of those. And then the gem, we will talk about the Granville Feeder Canal to wrap up our program tonight. So let's get started. Uh, here's my family. Uh, three of them are here tonight. This is my husband, Jonathan. Um, he and I and our boys live on his grandparents' farm out on Deeds Road in Granville, and we absolutely love it. Um, and I have, we have three sons. James is 10 and a half. Uh, Joshua is nine here with our dog, Kenobi. And John is my youngest at five and a half. All right, and so I had no idea. Did anyone here know we have a national park in Ohio? Okay, some of you, I had no idea until about five years ago. And I said, why does Ohio have a national park? So I did some research. I found this very sweet book called Silver Ribbon Skinny. And it follows a 12 year old boy and his family as they work and live on the Ohio and Erie Canal. And it was just perfect. My boys were five, four and newborn at the time. I thought, oh, they're short chapters, we can do this. So at bedtime, we tucked them in. My husband and I took turns every night reading a chapter and we had a blast just learning about canal life through this piece of literature. Uh, when we went to Cuyahoga Valley, my boys knew what they were looking at because they had read about it first. They're like, mom, look, this is Lonesome Lock. Mom, look, there's an aqueduct. Like, Oh, they're five and they know what an aqueduct is. So it's just a really fun way to learn. And the whole trip was more fun for all of us. We did the same thing when we went to Florida the next year. I found a historical fiction piece about a man named Charlie Pierce and his adventures 
uh, in Florida. And then when we went to those beaches, it meant more. It wasn't just another beach, but there were things that happened there that we connected with. So my husband said, Sarah, you, you should share this type of travel. This literature-based travel is really fun. And so here we are today. So three and a half years later, after lots of research and work, I self-published um, Exploring Ohio Canals. And it's just been a real blessing to go around and, and visit with lots of people in the community and talk about Ohio Canals together. So this is my book. And here's Silver Ribbon Skinny, which is the literature piece that it is based on. All right, let's get into the good stuff. Ohio Canal history. So Ohio was the frontier land of promise. Uh, this was the West where everyone was wanting to come in the 17, late 1700s. We wanted to be here. And we got here and we became a state in 1803. And then we found we had a problem. Our farmers could not get their crops to customers. We could have huge booming years and still the farmers weren't able to make hardly anything because they could not get their product to anyone. So this is obviously a major problem. And they found that they were the poorest state in the nation very early on. So lawmakers and uh, Ohio leaders said, well, we have to do something about this. They saw the, Ohio the Erie Canal up in New York being built. And they said, let's discuss a canal. There were some people like, no, this is a bad idea. We are a young state. It's going to cost up to $5 billion for us to build these two canal systems. And the um, people pro-canal obviously won. And we now have two canal systems um, in being built in Ohio. So we broke ground here uh, in Lincoln County, just outside of 79, which we'll talk about in a minute, on the Ohio and Erie Canal. And the Miami and Erie Canal both broke ground on the same day, July 4th, 1825. This was also the same year that the Erie Canal was completed later in October. It took them a couple of years. The first section that was opened, uh, the top north part of the Ohio and Erie starts up in Cleveland. Cleveland down to Akron was the first section that was opened. It took them about two years. Um, Licking County, we were the problem area um, between the section out in Black Hand Gorge and there was the a section down by Buckeye Lake. They were both a hassle. It took them years to get through because of the rock and the terrain was just really difficult. And so we were the reason that it took us till 1832 <laughs> to open the entire canal. Um, Miami and Erie other, had some other things that had going on over there and they opened in 1845. All right. So who built the canal and how did it look? So we had several Irish and German immigrants coming into this area looking for work, willing to work for pretty little, uh, 30 cents a day and some whiskey and some place to hang out, um, shanty houses. And they were willing to do that. So that's who started our canals for us. Lots of Irish and German immigrants with pick um, pickaxes, shovels, and wheelbarrows. Uh, they were building a 20-foot, 6-foot base to a 40 foot wide top uh, at the minimum. There were sections that were, especially on the Erie Canal, that were much bigger in, in sections, but this was the minimum requirement. And they wanted the water to be four feet deep in a minimum. So these gentlemen came in working long, hard hours. A lot of them got malaria. Many of them died and said, no, I'm not doing this anymore and left, leaving an uncompleted canal system. So lawmakers said, okay, what are we going to do? And they decided to pass a law that required people serving time in jail to come and work and finish the canal system for us. So there we go. That's how we have our completed canal systems. All right. As I mentioned before, huge, huge risk. It actually ended up costing them more than the $5 billion. Um, I love this map by Walt Scott. He created it in the early uh, 1900s. And I, I just love, he did such a wonderful job um, and shows both the Ohio and Erie in, on the East Coast and the Miami and Erie Canal on the West Coast so nicely. Um, but now, look at this. There's very little of Ohio that's not somehow connected to the canal system. It's a huge, huge deal. So now we can get our goods, not just to people in Ohio, but all over the nation and even the world, because now we can go up to the lakes and over to Atlantic Ocean, and then down Ohio River, Mississippi, all the way down to New Orleans and the Gulf. Huge deal. So much excitement over this. And not only were we able to take to sell our goods, but we were able to bring things in. So now we have 
uh, more variety of food coming into us. Our clothing styles are going to change. The things we own are going to change all because of this completed canal system. It was our super highway. It made a huge difference in where our cities were located, how we lived, and did our day-to-day -day work. All right, here are some canal boat styles. Now, they had to fit within the locks, which we'll talk about in a minute. So they needed to be no bigger than 14 feet wide, and that was close. There was not much room between uh, them when they were going through a lock, and about 78 feet long. And they wanted this to be as close to this as possible because they wanted the most space to get as much they, as they could on to their boats. So we have a couple of different styles here. The top is a three cabin freighter, um, which is the style that you see um, up here in the front. Miss Becky brought this in for us and I'm so excited. Um, this is a three cabin freighter. And this was used um, to carry a lot of big bulky equipment. So your lumber, your stone, this is what you would have. The next one down the line boat was more common if you were carrying grain. And when they had to switch from carrying grain to carrying heavier, bulkier material, a lot of those line boats became three cabin, three cabin freighters um, and they had to change the style. And many of them were not happy about that change. The third boat down is your state boat. These were the gentlemen, their whole job was going up and down the canal systems, doing maintenance and repair work. And it was a big job. So that, and the, so the style there is a little bit different. And then the bottom boat is your tourist boat. This is your packet boat. And the, job, the idea was that people who wanted to get away and just vacation, they would pay very little and get meals for the day and just lounge on this boat and go up and down the canal. So it was not only did we have uh, people working on the canal boats, but we had people lounging and enjoying themselves on our canals. All right, love this picture. Um, this is a rough idea of what we would have. This is the three um, cabin freighter here, just a blueprint of it. The first section, you would have some storage, uh, your sleeping quarters, and uh, the middle, the main decks there were all your cargo. The back side is where your living space would be, roughly. And then the middle, this is my favorite part, it's the barn, because they needed animals to, to pull these boats, and they needed the animals to have someplace to live. So they had their work truck and their home and their barn all in one spot. So the middle was the stable. And we, I have a video here we'll show where they're showing the donkeys, or the, they're not donkeys, the mules coming in and out of uh, their stable section. All right. And that is what we've got coming up right now. So let me show you uh, locks. A picture. This is one of those concepts that I said, I do not understand how this works. So a water elevator, how is this working? So I'm gonna show you this video um, for anyone who like me, just not, not getting it. And let me pull it up here. All right. So these are some mules and they're gonna be go coming out of a, um, there they are probably a state boat based on how this boat looks and its size and where the cabin is, uh, the barn section is for the mules. Love this. You can watch, there's, this is a, like an 11 minute video that you can watch on YouTube. Um, it is just so cool. I wish if I, if 10 year old Sarah had seen this, I think could have understood it maybe a little bit better. All right, so here he is. So this is a lock keeper. He lived in this house over here and this is his whole job is opening and closing these doors making sure that everyone can lock through safely. So they've lowered the water level and you can see just in the, in the front there, there's another lock. And this was very common to have one lock after another, after another to raise and lower the boats. So the next one they show, they're actually gonna show you um, the paddle doors and turning the paddle doors and you're gonna get to see the water level change. Look how high they are. <laughs> and another reason, and this must be a, a smaller boat because they only have the one mule carrying it. So they must have not been loaded down very heavy. So here he is. So there are these, so they close the doors. And once the doors are fully closed, then they're going to turn the paddle doors and those open. There it goes. They open small doors on the bottom that release the water out. And it's all done. There he goes. 
So this is a newer, this is from the early 1900s, but still I think a wonderful um, example of what it was, what it looked like to, to lock through someplace. So a water elevator, and it was really important that the boats fit inside the locks or they couldn't do their job. And they said, and from what I've read, it was very close. There were inches on either side uh, because of, um, they wanted to get the most they could on their boats. Um, now, I have read different things from different sources. So it is said that somewhere in Licking County, they believe the first canal boat was built south of Cleveland. Some sources say it happened in Hebron. Some sources say it happened here in the Granville Feeder Canal. So somewhere in Licking County, the first canal boat was built, but it was too big. It couldn't go through the locks and it became a speakeasy. So there it is. Um, uh, and so, <laughs> um, and we will talk a little bit more about locks. Uh, you, many of you got a Licking County lock paper. If you did not get one and you would like a copy, see me after and I'll make sure I get your name. I will email you both the Licking County lock paper, um, just some fun places to see around Licking County where you can go see some lock remains for yourself. All right, another wonder to me, aqueducts. Once I saw this picture, okay. Now I get it. Now I understand. A water bridge, a bridge of water over water. It's just awesome. I love this. And this one, check out how many mules. They've got four pulling that one. So I'm assuming that one was really weighed down. Typically, they did not like to use this many. They would, if possible, own four horses or mules. Mules were, were preferred because they had a stronger stomach. They could take a wider variety of roughage. They were just overall healthier and they weren't quite as skittish. Stubborn, yes. Skittish, no. So mules were preferred, um, and they would rotate them out. So there would be two doing one shift while the other two rested, then they would sh change them out. So here are four mules. I'm assuming it's a pretty heavy load. And the gentleman walking with them is the mule Skinner. He was often a young a boy, a young man that would walk along with the mules or the horses. His whole job was to keep them calm and to keep them on the trail. So he did a lot of singing a lot of times. There, was a, there were a lot of canal songs and he just, his whole job was to just keep them chill. Um, the, the gentleman um, in this book talks about, he loved, uh, the reason his name was Skinny is he loved being a mule Skinner and he, half of the book is just him walking with the mules down the towpath with his dog and all the things that happened to him. So that's really fun. Um, so the idea is that there's a trail here for them um, and they are going to pull that with the tow line. They're pulling that canal boat across. And again, it's pretty tight. So the person on the boat had to be very careful, do a good job. Uh, there are several places where it said that they people would even hire out someone to go through aqueducts or locks, because depending on how difficult that particular lock was. All right. So anyone here uh, familiar with Showman's Arch over on Cherry Valley Road? Okay, probably everybody. But um, I that was one of the things for me. That was like my moment. Where I'm like, wait. That's amazing for Licking County history that we still have that. So when there was some concern about what was going to happen, I thought, oh, I really hope they don't tear it down. Um, but uh, so it's, I'm really glad it's still there. Um, so that is the aqueduct that we had, one of two that the Granville Feeder had go um, from start to finish. So that one is still there, but we have a missing aqueduct. They're almost positive it was an aqueduct, but the Granville Feeder also crossed over Ramp Creek. And there's no remains found at all. So they have no, they, they have an idea of where it crossed, but there's no proof of the type of crossing that it was. General canal historians like, yeah, we're pretty sure it was a, an aqueduct. Um, and they have found uh, stone, uh, exactly like would have been used to build an aqueduct at the base of a barn in the area. So that kind of cements that idea. So two aqueducts uh, for the Granville feeder, but it was the section of the feeder that the Canal Commission paid for. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, so, but Granville did not have to foot the bill for either of those aqueducts. All right, here's a pretty picture of Buckeye Lake Amusement Park. Water source, rain was not enough to keep these water levels up. So much leakage. It was really high maintenance to keep these canals going. So they had man-made. Can, they had man-made lakes. We had reservoirs, Buckeye Lake being one of them, uh, several throughout the state of Ohio. 
uh, the Grand Isle Feeder Canal, one of its purposes not only was to transport goods, but was to take water from Raccoon Creek over into the canal to help regulate that water level. We are going to get, I'm going to have a whole section on that. Thank you for asking. All right. Life on the canal. This, I just love canal culture. Um, this is, at the very beginning, started with just the guys doing this. And the women said, no, we don't think so. We think we'll come along. And so uh, it ended up becoming a whole family affair, not very long into the uh, canal culture. And everyone worked together. So the family that you see here uh, are the Nye, uh, fa is the Nye family. And the gentleman getting on the airplane is one of their youngest sons who this book is based off of. So this, the gentleman getting on the airplane is skinny, per Captain Pearl Nye. And um, he was born on uh, the river, uh, on the canal boat reform in Chillicothe, Ohio. And his whole story is just such a great, fun story to learn. But it was a very unique culture to have everybody working together. Um, but while dad was working, mom was having her babies. Like it was all right there happening in that 14 by 78 feet. Um, so it was a very um, lively place. Everybody had to learn. Uh, the children from a young age were right in there doing the work along with mom and dad. So if you want to learn more about um, Captain Nye's story, it's really fascinating. Um, but he was at the end of the canal era and saw the end of the canal. And then he worked so hard to keep canal culture alive through canal music. So he worked with um, the Ohio State University to document via sheet music. Um, I, and I have some of those songs. I was given permission to put some of them in my, in my book. And so there's sheet music. Uh, he also recorded over a hundred canal songs, one of which we'll listen to today. And you can listen to all of those for free on Library of Congress. Um, and he also went to a couple of different folk festivals. So it was just his passion. And there are some, some historians are like, oh, he, was, he didn't really care that much about the culture. He just wanted the money. It's like, okay, whatever. Regardless of his, his motive, it's awesome that we have over a hundred canal songs recorded for us so that we could hear and enjoy this culture for ourselves. No, no, I can't imagine too, too much, not too much. Well, and he lived after he did some touring at the end of his life, he actually made for himself a shanty out of an old canal boat that he put on top of an, of an abandoned lock and called it Camp Charming as a, to his neighbors. And so he, he definitely was a, a, a car colorful character. Um, so uh, canalers was the term for those who lived on the canal. And they called everyone else town jakes. And they mostly got along, uh, except for possibly the farmers. And we'll talk about that in a minute. They loved to work hard and play hard. So lots of water-based activities, as would make sense. Fishing, uh, turtle catching, swimming. And music was very popular on the canal. So uh, in, the, in the book, the um, boy talks about how they were dancing so hard that they, that they bent the wood. And so if it would rain that night, they would get wet as they slept because they were, just, they were having such a party on the boat. So I love that. And then winter months, there was nothing to do with your boat. You, you tied it up. And then dad and older siblings would get jobs at a local um, factory or mill. And younger kiddos would head to school and get their traditional classroom schooling there. All right, I love these rules. I found these relatively recently. I had to share these with you. These rules are uh, the formal canal commission rules, and they seem fairly appropriate. Okay, right-of-way rules, uh, if a packet uh, has, has right-of-way over the freighter. So the luxury, people on vacation, they get to go by first, okay? All your workers have to freeze, and the people on vacation get right-of-way. Okay, fine. When two boats meet going different directions, okay, the one going downstream drops and sinks their tow line so that the one going the opposite direction can cross over. Okay. Speed limit, four miles an hour. This is because there was a lot of erosion and you go any faster, you got the ripples going and it's making it worse. And then just like today, you have the I'm enjoying myself lane and the I'm going someplace lane. And they had the same thing on the canal. So if someone was coming up behind you going fast, you dropped your tow line and the person um, was able to go around you. Although it was the opposite because they had to sink and you came in the inside. So that the inside lane was the speed. Um, so this was what the canal commission came up with. Now, the canalers had their own rules. They said, 
we get to take the top rail off of the farmer's fence for our boat fuel. Mm-hmm. But that went over well. No. No, that didn't go over well. Boaters also may harvest the first three rows of crops. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yes. To, to feed themselves and their crew or their team, meaning the animals. Mm-hmm. And they always have the right of way over anyone else on the towpath. We rule. Um, so, I mean, they, they thought very highly and they were taking care of themselves, right? Not necessarily overly considerate of everybody else, what they were doing, but this was, I just thought this was very uh, colorful, these rules. Um, and so uh, if you want to learn even more about this um, part of uh, the canal life, there's a book called Life Along the Ohio Canal by David Meyer. Uh, and I have that at the end of my program. I'll show that to you. I, I do believe Granville's got a couple copies. All right. Boat repairs. Okay. When you're in the water, how do you fix a leak? I read about a medicine spoon in this book. And I, I'm like, I'm not, I'm not visualizing this. I, I don't get this. So I found this picture. Now I get it a little better. So there were boxes or bags that they would fill with sawdust and or manure, drop it down over the leak. And as the water rushed in, it would suck in the manure slash sawdust and expand filling the leak. That's not sweet. I thought that was pretty cool. Now, over time, work has to be done. So we have dry docks where you can pull in, they drain the water, and they can do more permanent, complete repairs. But this was a temporary fix for the time. And we also had uh, state docks where only the state boats were built and worked on, and then we had the public docks. I thought that was kind of interesting. All right, who likes to eat? Love food. And in this book, they talked about several different types of food. He mentioned things like Lake Erie boats and red turkey and punch and Judy. I'm like, I do not know what this, she did talk about what it meant. Um, but, and pleasant dreams were beans. So I'm like, I want to eat this food. So I found some recipes uh, using era appropriate ingredients based on what they would have had in Ohio in the 1800s. And uh, my boys and I made egg noodles and we had this fish. Um, had a great time. So I have those recipes in my book. If that's something you guys enjoy also. I, I just thought like bringing life and culture um, or canal culture to life. All right, we're gonna listen to Mr. Nye sing. Um, there, unfortunately, the instruments that were very common back then, harmonicas, fiddles, any guess why? Small, portable, portable. yep, exactly. Cheaper, easy to learn, relatively. All right, we are not unfortunately going to hear any harmonicas or fiddles in this um, recording, but it's still amazing to hear. So this is Captain Nye. He's going to be singing to you today. Uh, this song is called uh, Take a Trip on the Canal. Take a trip on the canal if you want to have fun. You may talk of your pleasure trips on the great lake, but a trip on these sailboats, you better take the cake. These take as tough as a fighting dog neck, and the flies they play tag with this cook on the deck. The potatoes she'll burn, let their coffee boil o'er, the fuel nearly choke you, so breezy the floor. The cook room's a limit, you must eat or try, and when it's all over, you laugh till you cry. So haul in the tow line and take up the slack, take a reef in your shirt tail and straight in your back. Whatever you do, be sure don't forget. All right. Now, some of they, they are hard to understand, but it's still fun to hear the general feel of the song. And they did record uh, or document some of the lyrics. So if this is something you're interested in doing, I will show you really quickly how to find these songs. So um, this is my website. And under additional resources here, I have a music section. All the sheet music that's in my book, I have recorded. Uh, my dad played it on a keyboard for me. So even if you don't play an instrument and you want to hear those songs, it's included here. But this is the, so these are the songs here. If you click here, it will take you to the Library of Congress link. There's also another a Moonlight Dance song that's fun. And it says here, PDF lyrics are available on site. So there are certain songs. If you want to go directly to it, you just go to LOC excuse me, loc.gov and type in Captain Nye and it will pull up all of his pictures, music, um, and several of them have PDFs so that you actually understand what he's singing to you. 
All right. So we've talked a little bit about how difficult it was uh, to keep everything in good repair. Uh, it was, especially with all the erosion, lots of leaks. The poor state boats had their work cut out for them. There was also vandalism. Imagine uh, you're not very happy with local politics or whatever's going on and you want to take it out on somebody. Sometimes the canals got some of that. So there was some vandalism because of political statements. There was vandalism just because people felt like doing something. And so that's what they chose to do. Uh, so there was, um, it was a pr uh, productive um, industry for the first 15 years or so. And then who comes in? But the trains. And at first, the people throughout Ohio thought, oh, this isn't going to be a big deal. We've just poured all this money into our canal system. This is our highway system. This is going to be the main way of transportation. And the railroads are just going to be a nice add-on. No, not so much. And uh, I thought it was interesting that at first, the canals were going north-south for the most part with feeders off to the sides. And the trains traveled, most of the rail going down at first, traveled east-west. Like, this is just an added thing. No, no, by 1860, we had more track in Ohio than any other state in the nation. And they took almost all of the grain transportation. So now the canal boats who were carrying a ton of grain, which was lighter and easier on the boats and on the canalers, are now forced to trade, trade over to lumber and uh, various types of stone coal, just harder on their boats, harder on themselves. It was a very difficult change for everyone involved. All right, so where did it go? What happened? There were places along the canal that had closed. The Granville Feeder Canal is one of them long before 1913. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But this was the final blow. So in 19, winter of 1912, 1913, we had a ton of snow that winter. And then Easter weekend of 1913, 6 to 12 inches, three days of rain. Rain, rain, rain. And the rivers and levees just couldn't hold it. And so the canals took a huge, huge blow. It's the worst natural disaster to date. If, and I had no idea this was a thing. I have this book here. Um, it's called Our National Calamity of Fire, Flood, and Tornado. They were scared. 1913, there were several floods that happened, tornadoes fires. There were people that were convinced it was the end. There was just so much going on in 1913. There's lots of uh, firsthand accounts in here. Lot, it's, it's sad, but it's very interesting history. So I've got that up here if you're interested in taking a peek at that. Uh, a lot of the pictures you see up here across the top, that's all Dayton and the bottom two also uh, as well. That's all, I mean, look at that. It's feet over these buildings. And there are accounts in the book of people just being so afraid and they just jumped in and were gone. Like they just didn't know how else to handle it. They were just terrified. So it was a very sad and scary period um, for, our, for our state as well as our country. And it was the end of the canal era. There were small sections that stayed operational. Uh, if you go over and uh, do any tours over on the other side of the Miami and Erie Canal, there'll be a couple places where they're like, oh, we were open until, I think they said 1920 or 1925. I'm like, no, you weren't. What happened with the flood? And they said, well, it was very small. Like, it wasn't like it was the whole canal that was functioning. It was small sections, and it was just um, locally, you know, friends going and seeing each other sort of thing. So, okay, I understand now. <laughs> All right, so for about 30 to 40 years, the canals were just uh, forgotten about. A lot of, of the areas demolished to make way for um, new developments, new uh, progress coming in. And uh, about the mid 1900s, people said, no, wait a minute, we can't forget this history altogether. Some kind of preservation needs to happen here. So we started having uh, people doing a lot of research in the 1950s, 1960s, opening parks, museums, doing some with educational programs and writing books. All right, that is the end of the general Ohio history. Any questions? Something I didn't go over. Yes, sir. Were the canals lined with corduroy to prevent erosion? Or did they, how did they limit erosion? 
That is a wonderful question that I don't know. One picture there showed round. Okay. Your silhouette, I mean, your cross section showed yes. round circles all the way down. All the way down. That would be stacking logs. Sure. Sure. They float to do something, right, down. to help to help keep it at bay. Right. But you'd ha still have some yeah, kind of maintenance up here. Right. I don't know. That's a good question. Thank you for asking. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. That is, that is okay. So everything I have looked at um, just says five billion dollars, and I've not been able to because I wanted the exact same thing. Okay, now now wait a minute. Like current five billion or then five billion, and I've not been able to find anyone who clarifies. So I've also I've also asked the same thing. Yes, sir. So were the canals uh, two boats wide everywhere, or were there constrictions? They were. They were supposed to be at least two boats wide and everywhere except the locks and the aqueducts. And so you would wait. There would be long lines um, at locks and aqueducts as you waited your turn to what they would call lock through. And then how, how dimensionally deep were the holes of boats that were below deck? I mean, if the canal was four feet deep, deep. how much space was how much water. space it was down here is what you're asking? Yeah. I don't know. You're asking a lot of really good questions that I should write down. Yeah. If if you actually, if you do have questions, um, I have a paper up here. If you want to know, um, write your question on this paper. I have a, a place for emails. Write your question on the paper. I will look it up for you, and I will send out an email to anyone who gives me an email with the questions I find over the next couple of weeks. So, thank you. Yes. And then you mentioned a commission. Yes. So it was state funded. The a lot of the work was. And yes. There, was there local levies for the Granville Canal or the Licking County Canal? Most of what came through Licking County was taken care of at the state level. But Granville did take care of the last little bit locally by themselves. And we'll talk about that in a minute, why that had to happen. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yes, sir. That's a really good question. Wow, you guys are really good. Um, I I know, so the, the book that I, hello, let's get back up here. Um, the book that I talked about a little bit ago um, had a list of all different like canal boats that had been registered and all their different names. Um, and there were dozens and dozens of names. And some of the stories I've read, when you waited in line to lock through someplace, you could be a dozen boats back. So that leads me to believe there were easily hundreds of boats along that 309 mile canal on our side. If that makes sense. Because there were two separate canal systems. And you could get from one over to the other via Lake Erie or. Mm -hmm. They were transferred, yes, onto other boats. I knew that one. Yes, they were transferred onto other boats that would then take them. There weren't any in tow path trails um, along uh, the Ohio River. Yes. So the people use their own rowboat? Oh, like if you wanted to just travel for fun? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yep. You just. Um, I don't know the right of way. For that, like I don't, I don't know how those individual, like if you just wanted to hop on your boat and go down the canal. I know you were allowed, but I am not sure how the right of way worked. And it may not have been a problem because a lot of the right of way issue had to do with the tow path and the animals and all of that. So if you didn't need an animal and you were self, you know, obviously then self propelled, then it wouldn't just stay out. Yeah, you got it. Really good questions. Please, if I did not know, and you want to know, please write your questions down because I do want to find them for you. Yes. Yes. Is that 
Is that body of water, is that actually part of yes. the canal? Yes. Mm -hmm. It was. The, the, the canal system is still there. Um, and the their canal boat is still operational by horses. So, which I have heard one of the canal boats, they've had to switch over to tractor, but that was during uh, 2021-ish. So I'm not sure if that was COVID related or funding related. And if they're now back to animals, I'm not sure. I haven't reached out to them and asked, but all right. I'm going to dive into some Licking County history and we can get over to Granville feeder history. Okay, so um, who knows where the Holiday Inn Express is on 79 south of Heath. Anybody? All right. That is your ground opening ceremony location. Uh, this is lock number one. It was considered to be, they called it Licking Summit. It was considered to be the highest point at the time um, in the state. People now are like, well, they were wrong. Thank you. There were some other places that were higher, but this was the place that was surveyed at the time and chosen. So this is the sign that is there for the groundbreaking ceremony there on top. And it was a huge, huge deal. People were extremely excited because they were tired of being poor. They were so looking forward to what the canal system was going to do for them and their families and how it was going to help the state grow. So they had a parade. Several bands came and played. Many speeches were made, I'm sure. And, and several people mentioned like being excited to hear these orders that were coming and sharing uh, this passion for this coming um, transportation system. Granville had their militia there and a band showed up. Um, we had the New York governor come down and he was the one who officially did the first spade of dirt. Now, our governor was a farmer. And so when he dug his spade, as the second spade, there were several resources that said he, sh he showed him how it was done. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, so um, it was just thought it was so fun. And it was in multiple resources. I'm like, well, I have to mention it. If multiple people had to write about it, I have to say something. So I thought it was interesting that there was this grand banquet that was organized. Uh, they hired a gentleman who was a hotel um, keeper in Lancaster to prepare the food. And it didn't go very well. He was not, it was not profitable. And part of it was because he was charging $1.50 a meal. People were used to paying 12 cents for a hotel meal. So little bit on the pricey side, most people packed <laughs> their food. Um, even people, I was one of the sources said even people who bought the meal also brought extra things with them just in case. Uh, and it had rained for two to three days before this event. Now this event, the weather was very pretty, but it made it more difficult for the gentleman who was transporting food and trying to cook food and all of that. It wasn't a disaster, but it didn't go the way he wanted it to. And there was, there was drama. So, um, but it was very cool to, to read all of this and see that it was a big, big event. Uh, so I wanted, so the reason there's a picture of my car here is because I wanted you to see you are allowed to pull off of 79 and park here if you want to. It's just a little gravel lot, but you could fit three, four cars there easily. Um, but if you wanted to go and just walk it and see for just rather than just drive by, you wanted to stop, you're welcome to. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that now. So this stone that is there, there's actually two different signs. The first one is on the stone that's here on the bottom, and it was put there on the 100th anniversary. And then we later put this uh, Ohio historical marker. So there are two different signs, and that's why. Um, so you can see here, there's only one wall. So they have demolished the other side of the lock in order to put down the road. Um, but it, 79 is roughly, which I think is pretty cool in this section for several miles, 79 follows the canal path, um, which is just kind of neat. And, um, you can go there and, uh, there are other places throughout Licking County that give you a little safer spot than on 79. So, but that is the groundbreaking ceremony. Okay, this is lock number nine. It is across the street from the works. 
in downtown Newark and there's street parking, safer parking. Um, and the road there is not very busy. Um, there's also a very nice, if you look here on the second picture, there's a nice platform and it's full of educational signs. So if you want to take someone and get a little bit of canal history, this is the most educational spot of the three locks in Licking County. Um, and they have a beautiful mural. If you turn away from the mural and head towards downtown, there's like this transportation history walk. So there's this whole, if you've never done it, there's this little history uh, area that you can go through and just read about the transportation in the Newark area back then. And then there are additional canal murals on the backsides of the building that face where the canal market now is. So if you're not familiar, if you've not gone to the canal market um, to do any farmer's marketing or craft sale shopping, uh, that is all there. And it is on the actual, uh, the road and the canal market is where the canal itself stood. All right, this one's my favorite. It has the most history and it's the most fun to visit. So if you want to learn a lot about it, I have a reference book for you, but I'm gonna tell you a little bit about it. So this is, um, the name itself, people want to like, argue about. So the sign itself says Ohio and Erie Canal Lock 16. And lots of canal historians say, no, no, that's not right. Okay, that it's a, considered the guard lock, that it wasn't Lock 16, that Lock 16 was elsewhere. But this is how it's been labeled. So what you know, this is what you're looking for. Um, this section at Blackhand Gorge, they couldn't put a canal in anywhere. There was nowhere because of all the rock to dig a canal. So they utilized the river. Up river, they put in a dam so that the water was still for a two mile stretch. And to put in the towpath, they blasted away the black hand. And that's why it's gone. So um, I, I know that space there now is the towpath was the towpath trail so if you ever go to black hand gorge and you notice underneath the stone a bunch of little stones that's why those are there they built the towpath trail but it was on the opposite side of all the other towpaths so what they had to do and when, when they got here to lock 16 they would lock in and then there was a canal bridge where they would have to take the mule skinner would take the canal or the mules or horses across the canal so they could be on the proper the opposite side to pull them through the river and then at the next lock they would raise them back up and the, and the mules would go back over and they would be on their way but this was and this is the only place i'm aware of in the entire canal system on our side that they utilized a river everywhere else they dug out the canal but in this spot there wasn't any place to go Sarah, yes they did that, uh, the bomb, whatever they did, they blew up uh, the black hand. I don't know that I've ever seen an actual date, I, I, what the year was. Yeah. I would have to look it up for you. I know it's in, the, I have the book right up here. And I would. I know exactly what chapter it's in. So I could find it for you at the end. I just thought, you know, given that the whole thing didn't exist much after 1825, <laughs> destroyed a, we destroyed Right. You know, right, for right, right. Because there was so much focus on, well, this is where progress is going and this is what we're going to do. I know, I know, I hear you, I hear you, but it is. And so it would have been the, I, I believe it's the early 1830s by the time they got this far in the construction area. But I know that the gentleman who wrote, I've got a Black Hand Gorge book here, that's very good. And there's a whole chapter on the canals and he has the actual year written there. So, all right. So if you have a paper, uh, these are just the three locations that are listed on the paper. I just wanted to give you a little bit of why I selected these three locations. Uh, I like that it, we still have, even though it's just half a wall, it's still cool that we still have the groundbreaking ceremony location. And each location gets a little bit, I think, a little bit cooler. So you have half a wall, and then you have a full lock with uh, doors, which is neat to see the doors there with this beautiful mural. But then I really like going on a walk and being able, um, did I see? Yes. And so see how on the, the top corner, I asked my boys, I said, would you just stretch out and hold hands so people can see how nice and flat and open this trail is? So even if you don't, can't do a lot of hiking, this is not, there's a dip. All, you have to go 
up up to the the road level and then back down and then it's all flat from there. Um, there is a nice sign that gives you a little bit of history that's shown there. And then if you go, if you're facing the lock, you can go down off to the left and actually walk through the lock, which is very fun. All right. We ready? How are we doing on time? Yes, we're doing well on time. Okay. Granville Feeder Canal. This was not easy stuff to find. Does anybody here know anything about the Granville Feeder Canal? Okay. Yes. I think there's a turning pond at the Harndon Reserve. Okay. I think it is anyway. Okay. Um, I did I did find out a little bit about a, a turning section um, at the end of Klaus Lane. I don't know that you can see much there, but that's what I've that's what I've read in multiple accounts. But let's talk about it. All right, so one account says 1832, the other account says 1833. So by 1833, we have the completed Granville Feeder Canal. Just to give you an idea, the census for Granville in 1830 was 362 people. So there it is. All right, we're going to have a six mile long canal connecting you in. So if you had your maps, um, and if you don't have a map, give me your email address and I will make sure to email that to you. Um, at the base, you'll see three arrows at the bottom of your map on, on 79. That's, that's the groundbreaking ceremony spot. And just south of that, you'll see where the road ties it or the canal ties it. That's the base of the Granville feeder. So uh, the book set, uh, described it as being 100 yards south of the lock. That's where the Granville feeder tied in to the Ohio Neary Canal. It's going to go directly west, where Kaiser is now, and then head north. As it heads north, that's where it crosses Ramp Creek, the mysterious aqueduct we can't find anything from. It's going to go up to where the, ba the Market Basket, that's the name of the business there, right? The Market Basket building is now, and then veer off northwest, that's where it crosses the Raccoon Creek, and take you to Klaus Lane. That is where the Canal Commission said, we're done. That's how much we'll do for you. Page's Woolen Factory was there, and that's how far they were willing to go. But Granville said, um, um, we want to go further into town, please. They said, that's fine. You pay for it. So they did. Uh, it was not inexpensive for them because they had to do both a lock and a dam in Raccoon Creek to make all of that work. So. The, what has, the reason you have the map you have is there was an article um, that has a rough sketching of, based on people's accounts, where they think it was. I took that rough sketch and turned it purple so it'd be easier to see and put it on top of a Google map. That's what you have before you. So this is a rough guess, but based on accounts of what people have shared. Uh, so this is why you have the map you have before you. And we already talked about the first canal boat could have been maybe built here. There definitely was a canal boat built here in this area, at least one. Uh, there's just argument as to which one happened first. Okay, so here it is. I should have moved over to that first. Um, so here at the bottom where you have the three purples, that's the lock. And then you're going over north. Um, I don't have my pointer, but right here at this top bend after it crosses what is now 16, that's where Klaus Lane is, and there was a big turnaround spot there. Um, some, an article that was published, a gentleman at Denison in the 1950s did his um, the thesis on this, and um, that is in your guys' historical journals. So if you want more information, I have it here. Um, and they did a turnaround there, and there were pictures back in the 1950s of some of that area, but I can't see it. So if there's anybody here that knows, oh, I know this good spot, you can still see this little remnant. I believe everything that he talks about in the 1950s article has since been changed, and so you can't see it any longer. But uh, you can still go to the end of class lane and say, here I am, that's a turnaround spot. Um, so anyway, that is that is the rough sketch. But I was pretty excited to be able to put that together. I said it to my mother-in-law who uh, grew up in Grand. I'm like, look what I did. I'm so excited. 
So hopefully that helps you a little bit. Yes. I, I think it's south of 16. Okay. In the Harbin Preserve. Okay. Because you can walk in and there is a dike. It's it's five four feet high, five feet high. Okay. And it's an arc, and it's just a remnant. Okay. And I think before 16 was there, that was the end of Klaus Lane. Oh, okay. They pumped it. Okay. And yes. It came side. further. Got it. It looks to me like it's an arc of a circle. Oh, fun. Oh, I'll have to check that out. Thank you for sharing Harden, that. Harden Preserve. Okay. Walk Harden in. Preserve. I'm going to, I'm and, saying that for the video. Go to the, when you can split, go to the left. Okay. And you come to a, come to a site. Cool. So for the video, Harden Preserve. There's a, you said there's a fork in the road and the yeah, path and go left. Of the, you come off of the Evans Trail. Okay, off the Evans Trail. And you can go right or left, or you can do the whole circle. But if you go to the left, you'll pretty soon come to a dike. Okay, yeah. I'll have to go check that out. Awesome. There were several mentions of the bridge, and I had to remind myself that 16 was not the bridge they were talking about. That it took it to the bridge, which would have been over Raccoon Creek Bridge, not over... Not, not a road bridge. And I had to keep reminding myself, this is not that bridge. So yes, it's it's important to remember what it looked like, and how different it's, it is today. All right, so what happened? One of the reasons there's so little on the feeder canal is that it could have only operated for five years as a commercial canal. Now, there are some sources that say that it was operational until 1870. But most of the things I've read said that was not commercially. That was just recreationally or people just kind of here in this area. But because of that change happened, all the industry moved from canal boats to trains. And we didn't have a train running through here yet. Missed out. And that's when we turned our focus here in Granville from industry to education. So uh, commercially, it's, I believe, from the resources that I've read, we only had a working canal for five years. So that's not very long for that investment and that time. Um, but change happens. Just got to roll with the punches sometimes. <laughs> um, so it was... Um, good, I lost my train of thought. That's okay. Um, but that is the, that's the end of all the information I could find. So if anybody else has any sources on Granville Feeder, um, I would love to compile that and I can shoot an email out to everybody. Um, but I was able um, to find a few, Mr. Chuck sent me a few articles that you guys have here. And then I was also able to, uh, Mr. Utter's book on Granville, I was able to pull some things from that. That was fantastic. It was hard to find it because it's a big book, <laughs> um, but I was able to find some of that information from him as well. Um, so that is the Granville Feeder. Yes, Dan. Uh, it does. In, let me go back to the map. There we go. Um, yes, for the majority of it, it does. I have to think in my mind's eye. Um, it does run parallel to it once it, but it crosses it first. So once it's crossed it at the aqueduct, then it would parallel it for a bit and take that turn with it as it comes north. I don't know where it was, that section that Granville built, that was the hardest to find any information on. Like, okay, so did it ever cross back over? Like where, if it like, what, where, was it north of the bridge, south of the, that was really hard. I couldn't find anything on that. But the section that the Canal Commission paid for, that I do know as it, once it crossed Raccoon Creek, it did parallel with it. Yes, thank you for asking. All right, any other questions? In general, did the roads and trains destroy the canals? Yes. So the roads and trains took a lot of the business. High ground, the high ground. The yeah. Well, and they and actually a lot of the places that closed their canals early, they used the canal beds or at least the towpath trail for railroads and roads. So it's very it's a huge blessing when you can find some place uh, like up at Cuyahoga Valley where they have saved and preserved the towpath trail and you can walk for miles on the towpath trail and they've preserved the canal there. So it's, it's wonderful. Did you have a question? So this is a uh, second thing the my ancestor sent away to the end of the 
house with the three of them both for us. Okay. We started catering. This is supposed to be my my Yeah. We started the catering um right there with Creek at Bear Creek. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly polluted the creek. <laughs> a lot of caterings are known for that. Right? <laughs> Right, right. Well, and that was, but. Okay. And I'm not sure which source it was that debated the other source. Um, it was in one of the articles versus Mr. Utter's book and how that all lined up because I believe it was the gentleman who was doing his dissertation and was asking locals, okay, what do you remember? And they were remembering the canal up and running in 1870. So but they weren't able to say what was happening on it. So it's confirmed that it ran for that short period, but how much, how much longer it ran after that. But there's just not a lot of, of documentation. So thank you for sharing that. I love hearing those kind of accounts. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah, that's a long skate. Yeah, that's a long skate. <laughs> All right. So, oh, here's the books really quickly. If you like short, easy reads, the first book is The Big Ditch. It is no longer in print. And the Granville Library and its consortium doesn't have any. But if you're interested, it, there are copies through Looking County Library. It's very, let me show you real quick. It's so fun. Jim Bar uh, Baker did it. And there's, it's just all these pictures. And this was the first one I read. Um, when I started researching, I'm like, oh, this is super cool. But it's visual. I'm like, oh, now I get it. I can see all these visuals. So if you're interested in something short, sweet, and simple, that one is a great read. Um, my favorite was Life Along the Ohio Canal. Uh, and Granville does have two in its library. And then there are several others within the consortium. And then Blackhand Gorge, uh, this version, there's two different versions. This is the newer version. It's the one that I own. And you can get it over here at Granville, but you have to stay because it's a resource. You can check out his older version, but I'm not sure what's in that. I'm not sure how much he changed his books. Um, and tracing the Granville Feeder Canal, I wanted you to see this. This is where I got a lot of my Granville Feeder information. This is the gentleman who uh, wrote his paper here in 1950 at Denison. Um, if you like the music, you want to see more pictures, Library of Congress lets you enjoy all of it for free. So loc.gov is where you can listen to more music and enjoy more pictures. A. I'm guessing there are people here that had the same experience as me, but in 1968 grade school, we sang a lot of here Oh, fun. Okay. Yes, yes, and, and yes, okay. This is one of my favorite. It is, it is the Erie Canal song, and Peter Spire, look at these pictures. Look at this, okay, look. Once you see it, you're like, oh, that's how the mules got in the boat. Boom. Like, I just, I love pictures. They help me so much with my learning. Um, so if you have anyone in your family that's like, I want to do some canal history, but they're five. This is a great book. And you could sing the song with them. And the sheet music, I believe he put the sheet music. Oh, he did. The sheet music is in here, but it's teeny tiny. But you could pull it up online and sing along. Anyway, it is, it is a really fun fun book, but yes, oh, with uh, just the canal music. Um, here are four locations. If you've not been on a canal boat ride and you'd like to, uh, here are four locations around the state of Ohio. Uh, my favorite that I've been on is the one in Johnston Farm. So if you're looking for a good day trip, it's about two hours over. Uh, they still have mules that pull their canal boats. And the gentleman who does the tour, this is us at the General Harrison in Piqua, um, He's phenomenal. Like he just really loves what he's talking about. And he talks the whole way out and the whole way back. And it's not bad. Like it's all good talking. Um, so if you're looking for a nice day trip, I highly recommend. And the whole farm has just got a lot of fascinating history. Um, Roscoe Village is also really fun. I've not been out there recently, but my boys and I were going out this summer. And then north, you have Canal Fulton on the east side of the state and Grand Rapids is up, uh, up by Toledo. So just locations to consider if you're traveling around the state this summer. All right, that is the end of my program. If you're interested, uh, the book I've written is not all informational. It's divided up into three sections. The first 
a bit is history. And there's a good bit I didn't talk about tonight because I focus so much on uh, Licking County and, and Granville history. Uh, I, there's a good bit about Silver Ribbon Skinny and his family that's in here. I talk about mules versus horses. I talk about George Washington and his connection with the canals. Um, so that's the first bit. Then the middle section is the literature-based section. So the idea is that if you like literature, that you would read this book and that the middle is a bunch of study questions and guides if you want to take that piece further and learn more. Um, I wrote it with families in mind, kids who want to listen to music and cook and play games that are all based off of this book. And then the last part, it's my favorite bit, it's all the travel stuff. And I took the time, all the locations mentioned in Silver Ribbon Skinny, I found them at Cuyahoga Valley. I tell you where to park and how to find them all. So all that work is done for you. Um, I also tell you, like, if you want to see all the locations, where you can find them, how long it takes you, um, best restaurants in the area, campgrounds, hotels, all the things so that it's easy. It's all planned out for you. Um, so this is uh, the first book in my series. Next, I'm hoping by this time next year to have Mammoth Cave National Park out. I've already found my book for that. I'm really excited. Um, and so this is uh, available tonight if you'd like to take a copy home or you know someone that likes to do lots of travel. That's something you like to get for them. Um, but that is me. I also have a may I already mentioned this, but I have a couple papers up here. If you'd like to get on my email loop, I haven't started it yet, and I won't bombard you once a month starting in June or July. I'm going to start sending out a monthly email with one or two book recommendations since I have books who will travel. It will include a book component and a travel component. So say I'm going to highlight Neil Armstrong, I'll have a kid's book and an adult's book, and then a location to go to. And then at the bottom, I'll have any updates, like what's coming up next. So if you're interested in being on that loop, I have a paper here and you are welcome to peruse the resources. The money up here I purchased is 1825-ish era for Ohio money. And I have business cards if you just want to take some information home. I believe that's it. Thank you so much for your time this evening. Thank you, Sarah. Absolutely. That that photo, I've forgotten the term already, of the bridge that carried the water yes, across. We know what Showman's Arch looked like now yes. when it was first built. That yeah. blows Wonderful. me away. Wonderful. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. <laughs> okay. Um, before we uh, conclude, um, I wanted to give credit again to members of our programs committee who helped plan these. Uh, we're trying to plan a half a year at a time, so we're just we're starting on next fall. But uh, present tonight, Cookie Sunkel, Nanette Macy Junes, and Sam Schneid. And then uh, also uh, Greg Dixon and Lynn Overholzer. Okay, <clears throat> our next program will be Thursday, May 23rd, entitled Memorial Day in Granville, 1873 to 1936, presented by <laughs> yours truly. <laughs> they twisted my arm. <laughs> Um, and th this describes, uh, it's our most rec recent pocket history, describing the early decades of Granville's amazing Memorial Day program as it evolved under the guidance of Granville's own Civil War veterans. Mm -hmm. It'll be at 7 p.m. here in the Robinson Research Center. So, again, thank you all for attending. And thank you, Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> oh. um, there were two articles on the uh, canal that were published yes. in the Historical Times which is our historical newsletter that we publish. And so I'm going to offer you a copy of each of them. Oh, um, thank they're you. also online if anybody would like to look for them. Uh, on our website, which is granvillehistory.org, um, you, can, you can find the copies under our Historical Times articles, which are all online now. Mm -hmm. You just search the canals? Or? If you search for, um, oh, sorry. If you get to our website, it's under a heading that says Granville History. And then you, one of the things under that heading is Historical Times Back Issues. And it's in there. Could you search it by topic? You can search it by topic, yeah. One was in 94 and one was in 99. Right? Yes. yes. One is in 1994 yeah. and one is in 1999. What is it called? Deep Cut? Deep Cut, which is about the whole, the whole part of the canal that's in this neighborhood. And the other one is the Granville Peter Canal. Which is just about the part that comes in the brand All right. right. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Everyone have a nice evening. Thank you. I didn't know there were two of them. Well, yeah, I, 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 <laughs> my apologies. I, oh. I didn't know there were.